my name is Bonnie Mann. I am a faculty member here at the University of Oregon in the Department of Philosophy, and I'm very delighted to introduce Professor Ophelia Schutte uh, this afternoon. Uh, Ophelia took her PhD in philosophy from Yale University in 1978 and is now Professor of Philosophy at the University of South Florida, where she's been since 1999, where she also chaired the Women's and Gender Studies Department for five years. Um, she, her books include Beyond Nihilism, Nietzsche Without Mask, which appeared in 1984, and Cultural Identity and Social Liberation in Latin American Thought, which appeared in 1993. Her article, Cultural Alterity, Cross-Cultural Communication, and Feminist Thought in North-South Dialogue, was first published in Hypatia in 1998, but has been collected in volume after volume of feminist work since then. Um, sometimes I feel like every time I open an anthology, that article is there. It's been very important in terms of um, uh, feminist thought and feminist uh, cross-cultural thought particularly. She, some of the important articles, uh, and I'm only going to mention a few uh, that Ophelia has written, are Continental Philosophy and Postcolonial Subjects, which appeared in Philosophy Today in 2000, Negotiating Latina Identities from 2000 as well, Dependency Work, Women, and the Global Economy, which appeared in the subject of care, an anthology edited by Ava Kate and Ava Feeder in 2002. And um, <coughs> Hypatia held a symposium, symposium on Ophelia Schutte, which was uh, a, a special Hypatia volume in 2004. So uh, Ophelia's work has been really important to feminist philosophy in the United States, as well as, to, of course, Latin American philosophy in the United States. Uh, and crosses and disrupts those borders very uh, effectively and very importantly. I wanted to read just a short passage from one of my favorite uh, Schutte essays. Uh, this is the one in dependency work, um, on dependency work, women, and the global economy. And the question that she poses in this essay, I think, is tells us something about uh, Ophelia's approach to uh, philosophical questions. She writes, how does the neoliberal program aimed at satisfying the wealth accruing dreams of abstract man affect the ordinary lives of concrete women? How is the distribution of chores and caregiving activities affected by the neoliberal utopia? I argue that the West holds conflicting values when it promotes ideals of personal independence for women and at the same, the same time that it supports neoliberal policies of structural adjustment that require the trimming down of social services. If the dependency worker lacks control over the use of her time, and if she is restricted in space to the general area or the specific location where the caregiving responsibilities take place, a significant disruption of her normal development as an individual occurs. And then she goes on in this essay to explore that disruption in a very careful, philosophically rich way. Um, Ophelia has meant a lot to me personally. Uh, she I'm sort of a second generation feminist philosopher in the US and she's closer to a first generation feminist philosopher in the US. Uh, this doesn't have as much to do with age as sort of when we uh, came into it. Well, it has some to do with age, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, but the advantage to me as more of a second generation feminist philosopher is that I have those women in the first generation uh, to rely on, to call up when I need them and uh, to have my back when I need them to. And Ophelia, even though she, I was never her student, and I have only met her in the context of professional activities and gotten to know her that way, and even though I argued with her about holding the Feast Conference in Florida every time, <laughs> and we, we disagreed very, me being in Oregon, I didn't think I should have to travel to Florida every time. Her being in Florida, she thought that was perfectly reasonable to hold in Florida every year. Um, so even though we argued about that, she has been one of those um, older generation of feminists that I call on for advice, that I count on to keep me sane when things get difficult, and um, who I feel that I can trust to always uh, have my best interest at heart. So please welcome Ophelia Schutte. Thank you, Bonnie, for that wonderful introduction, and uh, thank you, Alejandro, for the invitation, and thank you, all of you at Oregon, for holding this really very interesting conference, and um, I'm really glad to be here, and thank you very much. <laughs> 
So, um, you know, sometimes you get a little adventurous and you decide you're going to do something that you didn't do before. And that's what's happening with this presentation. Um, um, so I'll just, um, the title is Toward an Ethics of Women's Empowerment in Latin America. In this presentation, I tried to address a lacuna often found in discussions of Latin American ethics, namely the absence of a feminist perspective, allowing on one hand for a critique of a symbolic and discursive space in which normative theories are conducted in the field of philosophy, and on the other, allowing for attention to issues of vital importance to women, and I'm gonna use now the sexual minorities uh, phrase to, re to refer to uh, LGBT um, um, and others, persons. Um, this is because of the critique of heteronormativity that will appear in my paper. The introductory section addresses the concepts of empowerment um, appearing in the title of my paper and this is followed by some critical feminist reflections on the concept of power and some observations on feminist representations of women's empowerment uh, as, as in the context of stopping violence against women in Latin America. Uh, toward the end, I will transition to the topic of the moral construction of meaning and the historical evolution of um, uh, our um, interpretations of the meaning of humanity. Um, and so you will see how that goes. Um, uh, there will be a lot of liberation themes in my presentation, and I did not address Dussel's work at all directly, but you may, from what Dussel said this morning, they, there may be some points of overlap as well as difference. You will, oh, and, and I want to invite everybody to uh, participate in the discussion because this is totally new uh, thinking, and I, I've thought about these things for years, but I have never really put it together this way, so I welcome your comments. All right, introductory discussion. Empowerment may be a slippery term to grasp as we initiate this discussion. Empowerment or empoderamiento in Spanish uh, was coined by the feminist movement to indicate a view of power different from the one women have been socialized in or subjected to um, in masculine dominant societies and patriarchy. Um, and Sonia Alvarez, um, in political science, has done a lot of work following the feminist movements in Latin America. I recommend her work. I take it to mean something like the energizing of a woman's capabilities for a life of well-being and personal fulfillment according to those choices that she finds most meaningful. And additionally, the engaging, the energizing of women's collective aspirations and achievements for, ach for creating economic, social, and political conditions in which women and girls can live safely, uh, thrive together, uh, and work together without fear of discrimination abuse, reprisal, or ridicule. To understand the shift in awareness that empowerment signifies and why it is a feminist concept, I thought I would consider an ordinary example from popular culture regarding the popular media's idea of women's power today. And the reason this is gonna show up in my paper at the beginning is that it was initially scheduled for, sat for Sunday morning at nine o'clock, and I thought there'd no be nobody here. <laughs> and I thought I would kinda try to wake people up if they were here very sleepy. So as I was relaxing the other night before going to bed at the end of a very long day's work, flipping the channels on TV to see what, what if anything I could watch with interest, I hit on a TV show in which one of the Latino channels, in one of the Latino channels in the Tampa area. It turns out to be Telefutura, a, a channel I've never watched in my life before this night. Uh, anyway, um, and, and, and this program, this was a late night, night show, and it was hosted by three male protagonists who thought of themselves as rather masculine and sexy in an obviously heterosexual way. And they, because probably it was late at night, they felt comfortable with saying semi-sexual jokes and this, this sort of thing, semi-erotic implications in a masculine dominant way. They were announcing then that their, ma their main guest would be a Latina beauty all three expressed intentions of winning her favor. The female guest was indeed a slim, well-dressed TV star who joked around with these guys, playing around soft innuendos, answering their questions as to what she might expect in a male lover. More precisely, they bluntly asked her, what would it take 
a man to enamorarla, you know. To <laughs> what must a man do to win her heart? When hearing this question, she paused for some, a couple of seconds, apparently reviewing which trait she would mention first, to which she responded, and for <laughs> all the heterosexual men in this room would qualify <laughs> at the top rank, she said, I want him to be inteligente. <laughs> I'd like him to be intelligent. How interesting. The female beauty these guys were drooling over assigns intelligentsia as the first positive trait she would want in her ideal suitor. As this is a staging of sexual roles, it is not clear, however, whether she may be smarter than they, in which case intelligent is how she would want her suitor to feel with respect to her, not necessarily meaning that he's the more intelligent one of the two. And as this kind of semi-comedy developed, it did look like she was very smart herself, equally or more than the three guys. But anyway, um, she, next she had them doing a contest to see which one got her preferred attention. In other words, they had to compete among themselves to win her favor. Um, these sexual games appeared to give the woman a lot of power. With her beauty, she can take her time letting them compete for her, and thereby she exerts power over which, if any, of the three potential suitors she might accept. The men declare their interest. She has the final word. So let's suppose this to be a fairly uh, mainstream representation of bourgeois heterosexual conduct, Latino style. Uh, and I stopped watching the program at this point since it led me to reflect on the representation of female power in the popular media and how this differs from the concept of women's empowerment that I'm developing in the paper. But it made me face the reality that in Latin American culture, what I want to argue in this presentation is not the accepted social expectation of women's exercise of power. So let's consider first what this social expectation appears to be. Now generalizing, one could say that in Western masculine dominant contemporary societies, by which I include most of Latin America as its gender concepts have been produced through colonization by the West. A woman is represented as powerful in three main categories, or maybe more, but you know, I've got three. First, as an object of heterosexual desire, that is, as sexy, or more generally, as desirable in her looks. Second, as a mother, also in this category as a wife, or if a widow, as a widow of a prominent man. And third, as wealthy, or, or you know, at least having uh, income potential acquisition, um, I mean, income acquisition potential. The greater, now what I want to hold is that the greater the discrimination against women, the greater one might expect to find obstacles to her autonomy in these three categories her sexuality, her maternity, and her income-generating ability. Um, and um, I want to say, before I get into this, because I talk about autonomy several times throughout the presentation, that in feminism, we have a modified concept of autonomy. We, we don't have that sort of dis disembodied uh, autonomy kind of concept that comes from uh, the uh, European tradition, but mostly uh, autonomy is is um, is discussed in the in the context of a relational self, uh, and this has been um, a legacy of, chem of feminist care ethics that we see the self as relational and interaction with other people. But still, within that context, you can talk a more or less degree over your own life. Um, so anyway, um, for example, in the first category of power attributed to women, sexuality and looks, as that example of the um, popular media showed. Uh, as we know, however, the restrictions against women's free exercise of their sexuality are legion. There's a double standard of sexual morality for men and women, as well as the control of women's bodies through outlawing homosexuality and same-sex unions, limiting access to contraceptives and various other means. There's also the problem of the high incidence of rape and domestic violence and any other pattern of mixing sex and violence, sex trafficking, uh, sexually specific war crimes, and so on. Continuing in this first category with regard to beauty uh, and the power that women are socialized to think is theirs because of their good looks. One problem comes from the time and money it takes to achieve and maintain such looks. 
Another problem comes with aging when the looks start fading, and this leads women to take extraordinary steps in order to keep looking young even as they age. And there's another problem that's not age-specific insofar as anyone who deviates from the norm of what, make, of what is thought to be good looks or what is marketed as such in capitalist society suffers from having to adjust to this external uh, uh, norm for feeling attractive. And the consequences is that women sometimes damage their, themselves through the depress chronic depression and so on because they can't fit these paradigms. With regard to the second category, maternity, perhaps the most powerful role that mainstream society allows for women in, in Latin America, and it's a very respected role for the most part, there's yet another area of subject uh, that is subject to enormous social control. Uh, these extend from the lack of suitable health services to women, uh, to limited access to contraception, to forcible pregnancies, uh, to unwanted sterilization, all in clear violation of a person's freedom of choice for which a combination of basic needs as health care and basic freedom as full control over their bodies is required. With regard to the third category, wealth and income, numerous concerns arise. Well, of course, the country is full of poverty, so, but still, um, there are a lot of problems there. Um, women's ability to hold and transfer property such as it is, um, fairness of distribution of of household um, common property in the cases of divorce and especially when uh, people are splitting uh, consensual unions rather than marriages where marriage is more protected by law. Um, and also there's often very limited knowledge uh, among women of what their legal rights entail. So feminist researchers doing case studies uh, in Latin America find that in a multitude of cases, a woman may not fight for or claim her economic rights to property because she's socialized to think that she doesn't have such a right or she's socialized to think her children are more deserving than her herself. And this uh, affects uh, also the lot of widows um, in particular because they are they often have um, difficulty getting their portion of, of uh, their uh, property after their husband pass a, passes away for various reasons. Um, there's a very interesting study um, by Carmen Diana Deer and uh, serv several co-authors of uh, a recent study that they finished in the country of Ecuador, which Ecuador now with this democratic uh, government that they have have fairly good uh, laws regarding women and girls' inheritance of property and use of property and so on. And they still found a lot of problems, including lack enough of um, uh, lack of knowledge of family law among uh, Ecuador lawyers, for example. Family law is not studied as much as other branches of the law. Um, so they are uh, using this term that's called patrimon patrimonial violence. Um, and they are making a recommendation to the government of Ecuador at the end of the study that I, I thought I would just read a minute. It says, uh, Ecuador has passed in 1995 a very important and very good domestic violence law, um, but it defines domestic violence narrowly using only physical, psychological, and sexual violence. And they say, although the government has recently adopted a rather admirable national plan for eradicating violence against women, it still does not include patrimonial violence as a form of violence against women, and one that is o often related to other types of domestic violence, particularly psychological. So they want um, um, much more attention to be drawn to patrimonial violence and to have it treated as a violation of women's uh, human rights. Um, patrimonial violence meaning um, um, uh, interference with women's access to um, property rights. Now, overall, in my sketch, even if my sketchy analysis and examples are not exhaustive, it is easy to see that what the social world tells women about their power in the world is rife with falsehoods and misrepresentations. And here's the problem, to change the values from the ones serving the goals of male domination to those serving the goals of female emancipation, a big shift uh, in critical awareness and ethical commitment is needed. Reformist approaches to women's empowerment lobby for a shift from heteronomy to autonomy in the social and political categories where women's subordination occurs. 
Uh, for example, reformists uh, will support a greater degree of autonomy for women over their sexuality, strong maternity benefits, strong labor and property protection for women, and so on. However, right, these reforms, though admittedly improving the conditions for women's emancipation from discrimination and oppression, often coexist with a masculine dominant social and political order. So this happens because, among other things, first, on the sexual gender front, the pattern of heteronormativity over sexual and gender relations is not fully broken. And I think that, you know, the pattern of heteronormativity is, is a result of, of uh, earlier patterns of, of um, more forceful forms of patriarchy. Um, and in the second place, the sexual division of labor, whether in capitalism or in socialism, continues to undermine women's full access to equality and equal pay on the labor front. And then there are other patterns of domination and discrimination and marginalization by race, class, sex, you know, no, sorry, by ethnicity, religious affiliation, et cetera, that continue to, co to, um, um, to function in all these contemporary societies, so much so that the advance, the absence, sorry, of a social and political goals to end exploitation and discrimination in general will doubly or triply affect women in particular who suffer on, alongside some of these other categories besides gender and sex. Um, so anyway, um, it is easy to look the other way um, when one encounters the absence of freedom across the board in a society, either because the concept of freedom is narrowly limited to exclude deliberation on its full meaning or because only the most urgent forms of oppression are taken under consideration. So in response to the question of urgency, uh, however, a lot of radical feminism insists that crimes against women deserve our full range of attention. They point to the high incidence of domestic violence and rape, as well as to the idea on the, to the data on femicides in Latin America. And Ciudad Juarez, everybody knows about that, but there's, there's groups in every country, for example, in, in Chile. And radical feminism argues that despite the legal protections offered citizens in Latin American countries, there's a hidden side of citizenship that must be brought before public discussion, and this is the vulnerability of women's bodies to physical and psychological violence. Raquel Olea, who's a very noted uh, Chilean feminist, has written that these forms of violence are, are very complex, that the, their knowledge reveal a, a kind of symbolic violence, um, and that it, uh, this symbolic violence is, is widespread in a culture because it is, the culture is founded in relations of domination um, and uh, co going back all the way to colonialism and that it takes uh, particular forms of sensibility and attention to be able to detect these, these uh, kind of like ordinary daily forms of violence. And she says that el lenguaje es su primer campo de acción, so language is his first field of action. And not only um, el lenguaje verbal, le verbal language, but also um, the language of, of gesture, of images, and of publicity. So to watch for, to become more attentive in our sensibility to the different ways in which domination occurs um, towards women and other parts of the population, of course. In such an atmosphere, she says, women live in fear and are subject to different kinds of violence, domestic, sexual violence in any environment, gender violence, and patrimonial violence that I mentioned earlier, racial and ethnic violence, and economic violence as a result of what Bonnie mentioned and all, most of these Latin American feminists mentioned as a result of the impoverishing policies of neoliberalism uh, in Latin America, and in basically in peripheral, peripheral capitalist economies. Now, stopping violence against women is one of the highest priorities in the Latin American women's movement. It is also a subject of academic interest for Latin American feminist research. Um, on the order of knowledge, furthermore, I believe it's appropriate to speak of epistemic gender violence, a serious matter manifesting itself on multiple registers in girls' and women's lives. There is the disciplining of bodies to comport themselves according to heteronormative expectations, the obstacles of girls and women's education, um, to girls and women's education, the type of education received, which uh, feminists complain that often has a lot of sexist content, um, and the ability of women to engage in academic and scientific professions in full parity with men. 
There's also the disciplining of women's minds to be smart enough, but not to raise waves, not to transgress the limits of accepted discourse. Nevertheless, um, many academic feminists keep pushing these limits um, <laughs> to the end, either by questioning the order of language and representation in their respective fields um, of expertise, or by joining together in women's and uh, gender studies movements, uh, programs to challenge collectively um, the androcentric and heteronormative symbolic order of knowledge. Uh, in Chile, also, Kemi Oyarzun, who, who has been uh, head of women's studies at the Universidad de Chile, has written about this and how difficult it is to denounce um, the, you know, uh, kind of like, um, this, you know, mass feminine support, fem women's subordination um, in various registers of everyday life and how, you know, it, it's happening at the, at the level of everyday life and so it's not like, as I'm going to go on uh, saying in this paper, it's not like a holocaust or a genocide or something like that. It's just happening every day in a, in a more or less ordinary way. Um, now, so, the, so in general, Latin American feminists have argued of, um, in favor of a shift from masculine dominant power uh, relations to women's personal and collective empowerment in both a negative and a positive manner. In, in the negative, ending the violence and discrimination against women, and in the positive, promoting uh, transformative, pro-democratic, pro and anti-authoritarian concepts of relations among the genders. And um, ultimately, I think this leads to uh, respect for women's rights as human rights. Um, so how am I doing for, how much more time do I have, Alejandro? Well, but I have a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> okay, my focus here is the positive front. Now, you know, I'm trying to move away from the, you know, stopping violence against women. Positive front is so far stopping violence and discrimination is a necessary condition for collective empowerment. But it's not a sufficient condition of empowerment except in the in the relative sense that insofar as we start, uh, we continue to live under oppression and discrimination to protest against it is empowering. But um, I want to consider uh, in terms of ethical theory, uh, what women are to be empowered for. And until the violence and discrimination against women stop, women cannot be considered collectively empowered, even as if some individual women or particular groups of women may be spared the worst instances, instances of these general harms or injustice. So I believe really um, that it's on the other side of the violence that the horizon opens for women's empowerment as moral agents and social and political subjects where equality, justice, and freedom can arise as positive goals. Um, so how does it happen? So the next section is to toward a feminist ethic. So how does it happen that we can imagine and conceptualize a different economic, social, political, cultural, and ultimately s personal role for women in society more than the ambiguous one women occupy today, torn as they are between tradition and change or between male dominance and female emancipation? Much has been said and written about the social construction of gender and sexuality, and it doesn't take a whole lot to acknowledge that the historical nature and interpretation of these concepts as they have evolved over, of these concepts meaning gender and sexuality, as they have evolved over time or as they compare cross-culturally when we consider plurality of differently constituted societies. If the social construction perspective is as transparent and lucid as it appears to be, why is it that there's so much resistance against it in Latin America? And there, even among feminists, um, and so I think in part this is because there's a lot of confusion about what it means to say that um, sexuality, sexuality and gender are socially constructed. So uh, as just a point of discussion, I was reading a male theorist, um, uh, Fernando Salmeron, who uh, a bunch of years ago, he wrote an, an essay, a chapter on cultural diversity um, in the Encyclopedia Iberoamericana de Filosofía that Eduardo was talking about for a while. And uh, this, in, in this article, he, he says, well, it's, it's becoming more usual to think of 
of the social construction of persons, he says. Although he resists that, he says, well, at least it, there's a social dimension of who we are. Uh, but he was struggling with that. He thought that even when uh, we admit that we are the product of social relations, that there's still another part of oneself that that is that como un yo profundo, you know, like a profound self that that is free from that, and uh, that that is a source of our freedom. And I was thinking about how influential feminist theory has been in trying to talk about the relational um, nature of, of the self, of the human person, and how when feminists think about the relational nature of the human person, we, we don't think that that deprives women of freedom or men of freedom. We just think that, you know, we, we um, uh, kind of like, emerge as humans in our constant interactions with, with other people and and that de obviously depending on the possibilities for freedom in, in the societies in which we live, we make, make choices, not that the choices are unlimited. But um, so I prefer, I, I prefer not to talk at all like about the social construction of persons. I think that's somewhat misleading. I think it would be clearer to talk about the the social construction hypothesis meaning um talking about gender roles and talking about um the meaning we attribute to to sexuality or to sexual orientation or sexual relations um so um here um and let's see where i'm going so and the other thing that I want to do now is instead of, of talking about the social construction hypothesis in reference to persons, to talk about discourse and the various components of discourse, the role discourse plays in our processes of socialization. So the power knowledge aspect of discourse, as Foucault formulates it, the question of epistemic representation in discourse, how things are represented in discourse, for example, masculine, feminine, deviant, and so on. Um, the problem of ideology and a host of other problems. So if we take that extra step to the discursive level, and much contemporary feminist theory in Latin America has done this, what we find is that social construction refers to the place gender and sexuality, that is the treatment of gender and sexuality within, you know, what, how does it operate within particular discursive formations? Or how does it operate in the production and reproduction of discourse as such? So attention to discourse, I, mean, I mentioned Foucault here indirectly, but it's also pursued by the Habermasians and the post-Habermasians, except that unlike the Foucauldian post-structuralists, feminists or otherwise, Habermasians place a strong emphasis on the notion of impartiality as a criterion for deliberative reasoning. In my opinion, however, a post-Foucauldian perspective is far preferable um, because in Foucault, you can really talk about the asymmetrical conditions of power involving both the stability and the instability of discursive formations and how, you know, it how that asymmetry in power makes it implausible for speakers um, as party to a dispute about discrimination or oppression to make their claims or state their arguments on an equally flat epistemic platform or surface. So for this reason, in my opinion, the, the post-Foucauldian concept of place of enunciation developed by Walter Mignolo, uh, Homi Bhabha, and others is far more appropriate for cl critical reflection on the status of discursive form formations and elements therein than the search for the justification of the so-called better argument under conditions of impartiality, which is more or less the, the standard of normative deliberation in, in Habermasian theory. The latter consideration as such, this, this um, appeal to, the, to impartiality um, is, I believe, a product, already the product of a discursive formation whose rules are not without legitimate interest in philosophical discourse as they are in large part the products of the philosophical discourse of modernity. But still I would like, but 
but which has impacted everybody um, now. Um, despite my preference for a more Foucauldian approach, um, I would like to explore the option here of talking about um, a post Habermasian discursive ethics and in the process of exploring the social construction hypothesis. And the reason is that there's an interesting argument developed by the Mexican philosopher Maria Pialara that can help us bridge the gap um, from the idea of the social construction of persons that I mentioned earlier as interpreted by Salmeron to the opportunity of speaking about the social construction of gender and sexuality as supported by social construction feminists. And so the last section is uh, the historical and social construction of moral meaning. Um, in a study regarding the ways in which the concept of an atrocity shows up in moral narratives and the power such narratives have in shaping future moral thinking on such instances of human cruelty, the Mexican philosopher Maria Pialara argues that the moral meaning of the term humanity is socially and historical constructed. She claims that, quote, our notions of evil are all historical, unquote, and in particular, quote, we can realize that the term humanity is a historical construct that has allowed us to build on new normative contents only once we see what human beings are capable of doing to others in order to harm them, end of quote. And I, you know, here she, so sim following a similar approach, I would say that the deconstruction also of the term humanity or human, which you find in post-structuralist work, um, uh, and as challenged by critical race theory, feminist theory, liberation theories, et cetera, um, because they, it's challenged because all of these theories say the human is the European white property um, owning male, you know, you're not, you know, that, that term human is, is very narrowly constructed, There's, you know, th so we challenge that. Um, so I would say that, um, that I agree with the idea that there is a, a kind of evolution of the understanding of the meaning of the term humanity and that this evolution is historical and this evolution is part of, the, of social and political dialogue in a society, ethical dialogue. So in other words, this would mean that normative meanings of the term humanity can be transformed as we ponder on the, states of marg on the sites of marginality or exclusion such terms convey, given the large set of factors that over history have limited and continue to limit the senses of what is human. For example, when factors such as ethnicity, race, gender, sexual orientation, economic status, disability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, migration, um, religious beliefs intervene to construct a narrow definition of humanity or, a, or else a multi-layered definition of humanity in which some um, are thought to be more or less human than others. So when facing uh, injustice and social oppression, the question returns, um, what is the residue? Who or what are the leftovers of humanity, the marginalized or objective ones in any social milieu or historical period? What is the normative model for the human and on what basis is any deviation from this normative model justified? Um, this moral issue also becomes a political question. What human beings considered discardable become the target of state actions to imprison, torture, uh, expel from its territories or even exterminate um, as the Jews were by the Nazis, um, which is the primary case that Maria Pialara explores or let's say socialists by Pinochet, uh, or homosexuals by right-wing dictatorships, and even by some uh, form of democracy. So while the object of Lara's analysis is the clarification of special acts of extreme cruelty, specifically atrocities, uh, crimes, uh, crimes against humanity is the phrase that, that she finds emerging in, in the second part of the 20th century. My concern here is, is less the intensity of the cruelty concentrated in one historical episode as happens in specific atrocities. Uh, my concern rather is directed toward the extension of secondary status to a vast category of people, in this case, people called women. 
the analysis that corresponds to this type of concern involves critical inquiry into the process of gender construction and representation, which is a matter of everyday life and is simultaneously supported by sy symbolic systems of masculine dominance operating in our discursive practices and legal institutions unless challenged explicitly. I claim that unless strong measures are taken in civil society and the law to redress this injustice, the social construction of gender as an identifying classificatory as well as normative category condemns women to a secondary social and citizenship status in relation to men of their own group at the same time that it condemns sexual minorities to marginal status vis-a-vis -vis people in their own, other, you know, straight people in their own groups. I see a logical and existential link then between the concepts of social construction of the meaning of gender sexuality and the social construction of the meaning of humanity itself. In other words, the moral meanings of such central concepts as human rights, basic human needs, human dignity, and so on, terms that are part and parcel of moral theories are tightly linked to the moral interpretations we hold of gender and sexuality. It is in this context that discursive approach approaches to the destabilization of heteronormative or simply mainstream sexual and gender positions make special sense insofar as the mainstream occurs in a sedimented or explicit masculine dominant symbolic order or the order of representation. In this context, numerous, ex numerous examples can be found in fiction written by feminist women and, and by authors of either gender who don't conform of any gender to sexual gender stereotyping. And it's often found in feminist literary criticism too. Um, um, all too often such fiction, however, is cataloged as women's narrative and writing, writing by women, so they, they are marginalized from mainstream, from the other set of fictions. So this, <laughs> here I'm going, to another point that we're, we're meditating about. So the ethics of disruption and dissensus, contrary to the ethics of collaboration and consensus, aims at shaking people out of their complicit conformity with heteronormative discourse, that's in feminism, instead of patiently waiting for the result of persuasive reasoning to make them change their attitude on matter. In this context, the author uh, and feminist critic Sylvia Molloy recommends that feminists break out of the counter-narrative of literature written by women and that gender should be used um, to uh, disrupt. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay, thank you. Uh, as the point of what she calls reflexive intervention for diverse ways of critically reading the totality of the cultural text and not just solely select parts, end of quote, from Sylvia Molloy. In other words, the concept of gender and sexuality in their social construction can be used to implode the system of masculine and heteronormative dominance from inside by attending to its fissures in the representation of gender and sexuality. And Molloy does this in the article that I was reading uh, by, uh, by she's, she was reading about Sarmiento and, and national, uh, you know, the, the whole nat narrative of na national formation. And they found a, a small incident where apparently a queer person was encountered. <laughs> and there was, it was quickly silenced over because the, you know, it just didn't fit into the, na into the narrative of the national f formation of Argentina. So it, it just gets passed over very quickly. Um, and so she said, um, lo que yo propondría como ejercicio crítico, what I would propose as a critical exercise, um, a partir del género, uh, from, the, from the standpoint of gender, it, uh, I'll try to do this in English, is the, translating her, is the intervention of a Una lectura llamativa, which I would say a scandalous reading, um, in the double sense of this term that is notable or scandalous, if you wish, and at the same time, one that interpolates the, the tradition. Um, a um, a re reading, not just to, um, to rescue the forgotten texts or texts that were not read properly 
but to seizure, uh, to interrupt uh, lecture established le uh, readings. So uh, my question, scandalous readings, <laughs> scandalous readings and ethics. I see what I got. I got to this point. <laughs> we are at a conference in ethics. <laughs> Um, I don't think Molloy is talking about using a scandal to give testimony or voice to an injustice. As a, a one might use the term to say, oh, it's a scandal that so many women are raped every minute and so on. But it's a scandalous reading in terms of the usual narrative of, um, you know, the meta narratives of national formation or the meta narratives of cultural identity and all these meta narratives and narratives that we engage in which marginalize um, sexual minorities and often ma marginalize the, the voices of women and so on. So I think I'll skip here and, um, and I want to just say that um, I am gesturing toward an ethics of women's empowerment in Latin America and I restate my earlier point. In so far as we seek an exercise of, exercise of power beyond violence and domination, and this is controversial I admit, because perhaps we can never get rid of violence and domination completely, but I think, I guess from the utopian tradition of Latin American philosophy, at least I think we have to think in toward, as a toward in that direction. Um, it's important to restore the people <laughs> to the, on the vulnerable side of economic, social, and political relations to a position where they can lead full autonomous lives with respect to those domains where they have been subject to marginalization, underrepresentation, and oppression. And I maintain that some of these obvious domains for, the, for women, as uh, the domain of sexuality, of motherhood and family relations, of wealth and access to property and so on. Um, and in the course of this discussion, it's also come to light that the domains of cultural representation, access to discursive competence, an ability not only to participate but to take a leading role in the construction and interpretation of moral meaning are also critically important to women's empowerment. Moreover, these domains, in my opinion, should not be considered separate compartments of a woman's life. Indeed, so yeah, she gets her sexual rights over here and her motherhood rights over there, and, you know, this other over there. But I think that when you're dealing with concrete people, that we all need to be in all these places, and so we also have to think about how how we're given that there's a lot of tension and contradiction in everybody's life, how we're going to deal with all these aspects of our social relations that, you know, you cannot, you can find laws that, you know, deal with one aspect or another aspect or another, but eventually we are whole human beings and we have to interact and live as such. So I, I hope that we can consider this idea of the historical transformation of moral meaning and that um, we can uh, move in the direction of giving more space and representation to women's voices so that they're not silenced as our venerable Ancestress uh, Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz was put in a position where she had to silence herself in order to survive in that terribly colonial and patriarchal culture. So uh, we have time for questions. two questions on the concept of empowerment that you're using. Um, and the first question is the sort of order of priorities that you set out. You said um, that stopping violence was a condition for the possibility of women's empowerment. And I'm wondering if it's not the other way around, that women's empowerment might be a condition for the possibility of stopping violence, which means we have to find some other way to achieve that empowerment um, that wouldn't rely on the precondition of having lives that were free of violence. Um, so, th so that's my first question. And my second question, um, sometime in the 1980s I gave a talk where I asked people to reflect on the difference between being empowered and being in power uh -huh. with a preference for the latter, <laughs> uh, suggesting that perhaps the project of empowerment was um, deflecting uh, feminists from really engaging in kind of concrete relations of power 
in a, in a uh, more political way because the, the project of empowerment tends to be quite personal and intimate even though it is something that happens within a community in, in an intersubjective context. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the same as a project of taking political power. So those are my two questions for you. It's not the same, empowerment is not the same as taking political power, you said. But uh, nevertheless, women need to take political power. Well, to, I'm uh, wondering if, if, we if the focus on empowerment might actually make us forget that we might also want power in that more um, public political sense. Yeah, no, I, no, these are very important considerations. And I, even when I wrote that sentence, I was thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't say it this way. Um, I, it's been a point of debate among feminists. And, um, and some of this debate I have heard in Latin America regarding women taking power. And it, it is a huge, huge debate in the Latin American feminist movement, so much that for a while at the end of the 20th century, it almost bro broke up the, the feminist movement apart because there were, uh, as democratic, well, the, the background of this is that when there were um, explicit dictatorships like Pinochet in Chile and various others throughout the Latin American continent, um, the women who were resisting masculine dominance were also resisting uh, established governments uh, because these governments were extremely patriarchal with a dictatorship. But after there were these so-called transitions to democracy, a lot of these feminists ended up in political parties and running for office and being some of them being elected and so on. And then there was a smaller branch of feminists who called themselves the autonomous that, that criticized the other ones very much for being part of power, even of the power structure, even if, you know, so they wanted to be more pure, some, you know, they wanted to, to be more radical, let me put it that way, and not be complicit with any, any established political power structure, even if it was a power structure of a, of a pro democratic, more or less, more liberal movement that would give rise to women. So this became a very big debate and, um, and I think the majority of people in the feminist movement want women to be elected to office and to have, of course, to become college professors, to take power in, in society in various different ways. Um, but there's still that kernel of, of resistance. And I wasn't really writing in terms of that, but I thought I would mention that because of the kind of debates there have been. And also, Celia Moroz, who was a very important um, Spanish feminist, uh, who traveled to Latin America many times and gave uh, feminist conferences. And she was a pro-European uh, Enlightenment feminist. So she was out there defending the Enlightenment, and which a lot of people were not <laughs> happy with uh, for all the reasons you might imagine. But she had a very interesting, <laughs> she said something very unforgettable at a, at a conference once where she, she wanted women to grab power and she says mujeres, she tells this audience at a philosophy conference mujeres a la catedra <laughs> to, the, you know, to the chairmanship or whatever, or no, whatever to the professorship and you can see, you can see the validity of that kind of argument um, the, this, this is more of an existential consideration on my Part. And the existential consideration has to do with gaining power, but at the same time, if, if, since I was at an ethics conference, what, what, what is the ethics of gaining power and wielding power? You know, and do you do we want to have a, a more transformational? Cons we we hold in the left some sort of transform. A lot of people a transformational theory of power of some sort. And so I haven't spelled what that is, but that is more or less where, what I was thinking. That, you know, as, as women now have gained a lot of power, actually, considering just like in my lifetime and just like in the last generation, you know, women have advanced a lot in Latin America. I mean, we still have lots of people who are disenfranchised, but still, you know, it's progress over what there was before uh, in that sense that, uh, so, is, 
so that it seems to me that that's not enough. Bec and this is why I, I more or less talked about um, we're in between like domination and, em and female emancipation. We're, we're in this kind of like in between stage where, you know, maybe some of the worst laws of domination are, are over, or at least, but there's still a lot of practices. Maybe the laws are not being enforced. Um, so we're kind of like in the middle. And so as we're in this middle of transition, then how, how do you think about power in, in more of, if you're thinking about it in an ethical sense and not just a political sense? And there's a lot of feminist theory that doesn't even want to talk about ethics. They just, you know, do, they just want to do politics. And then we think that by political empowerment of people, then eventually we will have, you know, the, the conditions for this other kind of power that you're talking about. There's a question by Is somebody going through? Uh, just I can wait if somebody has a question. Well, but can, okay, I'll go ahead. Fine. I won't be <laughs> so polite. Um, well, thank you <laughs> very much for that talk. I have more of a question. Oh, closer. I don't like microphones. Um, well, we were discussing at dinner last oh, night last something, night. and so. I wanted to bring that up again because you do raise those very important points of humanity, marginalization, and exclusion in your discussion of women's empowerment. And what's always bothered me in the Latin American tradition is that even amongst philosophers who are very concerned with this idea of an inclusive humanity, think of Leopoldo Sea, mm -hmm. they want to bring the indigenous mm -hmm. into that fold of equal rights and social justice. And you can kind of track all sorts of other thinkers who are engaged in that sort of project. You find a noticeable absence, and I think that makes your work harder, of incorporating women. You have nice um, advances. More strangely enough, when you and Linda Alcoff start to talk about Latina identity issues, but in this general theme of identity and cultural identity within Latin America, although so many of the philosophers are very concerned with social justice issues and marginalized groups, the one group that seems always to be left out and this silence comes back to haunt us is, with maybe the sole exception of Sor Juana, um, any sort of, uh, there's an invisibility of, of women's issues in that tradition. So I'm just wondering, because I know you have a lot to say about that, about this, this line, this problematic line within the Latin American tradition and what can be done to sort of fill that line in so that that presence, mm -hmm. that absence is eliminated with a presence that would help us achieve a kind of inclusivity that really goes all the way across the board. It's, uh, thank you for that question. It's, it's really important because if you know, there's certain areas of, so of specialization where women are more um, invisible than others, and Latin American cultural identity, as we practice it, or, you know, this, this is the very topic of this conference. Um, there, you know, we talked earlier this morning about, I don't know, generosity, cruelty, we talk about consensus, and, and the census, and, um, of a, of a, and and within within those representations of what we're talking about, uh, there is no representation of ex specifically of of the diversity of women's voices, mm -hmm. and it was good that Ansaldúa was brought up, and that was remarkable. But but you know, um, in it wasn't brought up by one of one of our Latin American experts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I find myself teaching texts that never mention women. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to go through a, a whole course. And we just edited a volume a couple of years ago. I, I co-edited with a couple of other people, The Companion to Latin American Philosophy, that was published by Bla Blackwell. Um, and only one chapter dealt with feminism. And that's a chapter that I inserted in there because 
because it just the team was absent from the entire volume, which is about also about 500 pages. Well, I don't even know how many pages, but it's huge. And and the the main editor, well, um, she says it doesn't matter because a lot of our contributors to the chapters are women. And it's true that we had a lot of women. And if you go to the uh, Iberoamericana Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and there's a lot of women writing about ethics, writing about social movements, writing about epistemology, ancient philosophy, and all of this. But in, in, in the entire you know, d discourse of philosophy, mm -hmm. this theme is very invisible, and it, it's marginalized. And, and I <laughs> so the reason I, I thought I had been invited here, frankly, although nobody told me, was that, that I, they, they probably wanted me to say something about women or what or feminism, and I, I tried very hard, but but um, it's not enough, and so um, I think it's really up to a lot of the men in the field to pay more attention to how to interrupt that heteronormative discourse. I think that's the only thing because uh, because I think it's through the heteronormative assumptions that that lie behind the the entire field that then when you speak of of human you think you're including women but you're not really focusing on on, on issues of, of sexual minorities or, or or sexual difference let's say and i am a real fan of jose marti i had i had another paper that i never delivered here but but I was going to write that other paper, and at the end, I decided to switch to this, which this is more spontaneous. Um, and the other paper, I was starting with Sor Juana and with Jose Martí. Well, Jose Martí said something really, you know, that has moved me and, and millions of people. And he said it at, at the end of the 19th century, and he said, if I want one thing for Cuba in the future, is for, um, for the, the, the Every, every Cuban to hold as the highest value and the fundamental value, the full dignity of man, la dignidad plena del hombre. And in the next example that Jose Martí gives, after he says this wonderful, wonderful thing, is I want every man to feel in his cheek the slap, as cruel that is, if another man's cheek has been slapped. And every time I think about that, I think about what if, what if, I cannot blame Martí who lived at the end of the 19th century, but what, what if, you know, everybody, what if the, when we read this we think about sexual difference because if, if you're talking about one man slapping another man's cheek, that's one thing. But, and that, then in that case, la dignidad plena del hombre, the, the full dignity of man, means man and man, male and male. But if you think that this slapping is happening, from male to female, or from female to male, or from female to female, then the whole ideation, ideational aspect of that figure is completely different. And then I have written one of my publications, of course, my team would have, would have been opposed to domestic violence. I mean, he would have said, like, it is absolutely inconceivable that men should be slapping women. But this, this sort of thing doesn't occur in our exam, in our imaginaries, because when the human is considered, the human is, is considered from, I suppose, I don't want to exaggerate too much, from masculine experience. And that masculine experience mm -hmm. is not necessarily foregrounding a problem of, of violence against women at that point. And of course, all these people are totally opposed to violence against women. You, I, I don't have any question about that. Uh, but it's just that, the, you know, there, I don't know, I get stuck there. So what we have to do, I think, is not just, and it's almost unfair for the topic of women to always have to rest on a woman's shoulder. Um, because, you know, that's kind of unfair. But, um, so I, I think that part of it has to do with more dialogue and more, more attention to this um, in the scholarship itself. And that, that may attract more women to this area of specialization, which, which has very few women in it. Um, Graciela Hierro, very noted feminist eth uh, ethical theorist, and uh, she died at the, end, at the beginning of the 20th century. She, t she told me once when I was in one of these earlier conferences in Mexico, why? 
Why are you being a feminist and you specialize in this? Don't you realize that everybody, uh, everybody's talking about issues that have no, you know, they never mention women. Um, and I said, Graciela, I'm fascinated by this issue. You know, these, these are issues that I want to be researching, you know. And I noticed that there was a sexual division of labor. You know, women do women's studies and men do Latin American <laughs> philosophy, kind of. And so, um, anyway, I noticed it back then, and it's improved a little bit over time, but, n but not that much. I don't know. You can, you can argue against me if you like. We have time for one more question, Eduardo. It's not quite a question, it's more like a comment. Um, while I agree with everything you have said, Ophelia, I think that one of the things that we have to um, be attentive to when we talk about the production of knowledge is also the places from which different forms of knowledge are generated. And I think um, in Latin America, while uh, philosophers don't do a lot of work on feminist uh, issues, there are other places within Latin America where uh, questions of um, gender are taken up, and that's the um, theological schools. Oh, yeah, this is so true. And, yeah. and it has to do, I mean, uh, yeah. with the role of religion in Latin America, that's Catholicism. Right. Right. So there is a very yes. strong feminist contingent yes. thinking out of theology, that's thinking true. out of uh, theological schools, right. Elsa Tamez, Yes. Um, Bingemer, right, right. Uh, et cetera. Yes. I can mention yes. many names. And I think right. that we can't yeah. simply just say there is no feminism. Well, there is, well, there is no feminism in, in the philosophy part. But yes, I think you're totally right. In theology, there have been many women, feminist women theologians. Um, this sometimes gets acknowledged in philosophy when people do feminist philosophy, but very often does not. So, yeah, I think I, I agree with your observation. Um, but then the question is that mi mili many militant feminists, and I have a statement that you can find on the web on women's rights as human rights by, um, by a group in Chile, No Mas Violencia Contra la Mujer. And one of the things they demand is a secular government, a, a laico, because because they, they don't want religion to interfere with their control over their own bodies. And so that's a whole other debate. How can feminists in theology put, put their arguments on behalf of women to, um, to be, and, and up to what point can they support, say, uh, women's complete reproductive choice and, and, and concepts like that, that in some religions uh, are are totally denied to women, uh, like Catholicism. That's if, uh, let's say, official Catholicism. So the demand for a completely secular state by this Chilean group of women who want no more violence against women is a demand that they don't want the complicity between traditional religion and the secular and, and the state. And even that the state appears to be secular, it's imposing on them dog, you know, uh, practical policies that came out of these patriarchal religions. So that's another battle I'm sure these theologians are waging, but feminist theologians are wage, waging, but it just leads to the, you know, to the lot of, a, a big deal of complexity there. But you're totally right, on, and um, yeah, you can give me the names of those women and maybe I'll research some more about it. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Ophelia Schutt. So we'll, be, we'll begin again in 10 minutes. <laughs>